Thanks so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizer for giving us a tribune and allowing us to have exposure to carry on the research because, I mean, media have a short attention lifespan, but thanks to you, yeah, I mean, you don't seem to have to, it's, it's great, thanks, thanks so much. So, um, well, now we're all familiar with these very sad pictures, 26 of April, um, maybe less with this. So these are the, the this per uh, how the oil is moving. So these are from the NOAA, and the blue dots are the government-funded uh, research, and the red dots are reports uh, which have been um, given by just like people like me and you, residents who live on the coast and who just complain. So each point represents maybe a couple of hundreds uh, complaints. Um, another uh, way to look at the, uh, the way the, the oil moves, and it, which is very easy to make it understandable, is looking at the current patterns. So if you look at the current and how the actually oil was moving on the surface, you can see it really matches. And then, so if you look even closer, you can see that it's not just a, just a geometrical form, just a patch, but it's a mo much more complicated shape. And if you look even closer, you can see that these are long strips of oil going down the wind and down the current and following the surface currents. So currently, like uh, Susan was saying, um, most, a lot of the oil is still there and out of all the oil that we could have collected uh, just after the spill, only 3% was came from the surface. Why is that? Okay, the oil is spilling and then we send a couple of, well, lots of chemos. And what they do basically is they're cutting clean lines through a huge surface of, of, of oil. If you use the same surface of, of a cleaning surface, uh, of oil absorbing material, and you push it perpendicular to the flow, you could collect already much more. But it's, it's very difficult to move such a surface. And you could do even better if you multiply uh, how many layers that you, you, you put against the, the flow. So that's three, and maybe, I don't know how, how much would be needed to collect 100%, but that's already much better. But again, it's very difficult to move. So our ideas was maybe the, what's moving the oil is natural forces. What if we actually use the natural forces and do the same pattern, so oppose and intercept the flow of oil? So that's, that's the, the, the basic idea. Do we have a chance to intercept the flow? And also, if we pull the boom, we will avoid this entanglement. Uh, a lot of the absorbing booms which have been placed were actually entangled because they left loose and compli complicated wave and wind makes them messed up. At the same time, pe people have really criticized this technology, but it's still well established. A boom like this can absorb up to 20 times its own uh, mass in oil. Not all uh, viscosity of oil, but still uh, a proven technology. So that's Prote. Prote, we try. The, the first experiment we did was we're trying to see if we can actually pull a tail against the flow. So we just took a normal sailing boat on a, on a river on a windy day, did a line, and then just zigzagging against the, the, the flow, and we could observe that each point of drag creates a, a shape that can oppose the, the flow. So it, theoretically and practically, we st started to have some sign that it could work. Then I need to give you a bit of background because what happened here is the longer the, the tail was and the harder it was to steer and to pull because there's more mass and I'm going to explain why it was difficult to steer. Uh, this is the basic of boat uh, design. So you have a hull and you have a sail because you need to move. And then you determine the, the center of gravity of the sail and that gives you the position of the center board. So the center board is basically to oppose the force so you have some kind of something that cuts through the water. And you add a rudder at the back to give you direction. And what happens is the center board becomes a pivot. So you move the rudder and your whole boat can pivot. But if you add a long tail, then you have so much drag, it becomes really difficult to have direction. So you're losing direction and capacity of pulling. So that's the reason why we developed this first prototype of protein number one. So basically it's just a small sailing boat with a front rudder. So, um, yeah. So just with a rudder of 14 centimeters, about this size, we can pull a tail which is longer than this, this carpet. So that means that with a very, very small force, we can control a big surface. So if you look at the, the, the boat closely, you can see the, the rudders at the front. It's very uh, unusual. 
And the way it feels to drive this boat is um, just like driving a car. When you're driving uh, a car, you have the front wheel, so you, you're driving and it's following. Imagine you're actually driving a car and the direction where we're at the back, it will feel very, very, very strange. So we kept on thinking of this part with the car, and then maybe you know this sports car, the 44, they have direction wheel on the front and at the back, so you have better control. So we thought, why not adding a rudder at the back, and why not three or four, or why not making the whole hull are, um, are articulated? That's protein number two, so basically we're trying to have more control. So it's a whole uh, articulated uh, boat, so it's, uh, it's just like a robot. And uh, so it's, it's very dynamic, it goes really well, it carves inside the water, so it has really strong capacity for direction. It sells up the wing quite, quite well. If you turn too fast, centrif centrifugal force will take it out, but if you go slow enough, it will actually carve in the water. And now if you know a bit about sailing, look at the movements of the sail. So the back sail, and the front cell, um, difference of the time where they're gonna shift. So the front cell shifts, and now the back cell is going to shift. But it took a couple of seconds. If you sail a normal boat, it's maybe it's a bit faster. What's happening is, if you're gonna up the wind, you're catching wind from both sides, which means you're turning, you catch wind from this side, and it all goes from that side, which means all the time you have pulling power. So that's a real, that's a real innovation. I mean, we, we haven't measured yet, but that means that we can pull very long load, very heavy, even up the wind. But we needed to go further than this. How, how do we actually implement this technology for having some application for the OSPIA? So we had it to make more powerful and lighter. So this is the same robot, roughly, but it's inflatable. So it's, all the process has been really DIY. We, we don't have, I mean, I reserve from MIT and I didn't have any, any more money to work on this. So uh, it's really buying plastics, like plastic bags, uh, duct tape, and trying it out. Uh, so you see this is, um, it's very light. So it has a big surface and it has a, uh, it's very light. So it has a very small footprint. So it has a strong, a huge power. So what we see in the future um, is to make it about this size. That means that we can re reuse existing uh, construction material like uh, windsurfing mast four meters high. And th this probably will be really simple. Uh, the, 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 most of the structure will be inflated with air, most of the body wind with water, and the bottom with sand. So if we, even if we collide with another boat, it's very safe and it's very cheap to produce. Uh, to, to move actually, to, shi to sh uh, shift the shape of the robot, we just need one winch. It's, it's pretty cheap to direct just GPS. Um, it looks like a blimp, basically. Like if you think about zeppelins, it's, it's, the idea is that it's, it's the zeppelin of the ocean. It could be as, as, as cool as a new class of, of robotics for the ocean for long travel or pulling a payload. Think of this as a, as a rocket. You could actually put a tail for absorbing oil or you could put another stuff, anything. So the idea is to make it really cheap and green enough that we can make many of them and we can have some swarm algorithm to control them and also use the, the, the people. I mean, use people is not a good word to say, but uh, at the beginning, I was showing the red dots. And so the people could actually participate in how they, they direct the robots because there's a, there's a demand for people want to help on the OSP and many people would be happy actually to direct those robots. So the reason, the way we want to do it is to develop this technology open source. The reason why we don't want to do this open source is all spills are happening everywhere all the time, not only in the Gulf of Mexico, they're all over the world. So we need to create open source hardware so people can replicate in other countries. We have the capacity of creating this technology, so we need to share. So, yeah, <laughs> thanks very much.